now, an eighth special presentation. Coming up on Art Beat Nation. A stripped down version of a classical dance. I think in the end it really is a process of discovery for all of us. A painter opens up about his lifelong muse. I like to say a lot that Monet had his water lilies and I have my neon signs. We learn where techno music got its first beat. It's their pilgrimage to the source of this music. And a gang of artists come to one space to create art. The hub is extremely important. It has brought all these artists together. It's all ahead on Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. Classical ballet may seem out of reach for some, but at the Wonderbound Studio in Denver, Colorado, it's all about making traditional dance accessible. From its reinvented costumes to vaudevillian ballads, each Wonderbound performance takes ballet in new and exciting directions. really organic process rather than uh, having this really strong structure. We just move into the conversation and see what fits and what feels natural. So we're not necessarily telling a narrative story in the tradition of Swan Lake or Sleeping Beauty, but all that technique underlies it and it becomes a more emotional journey, a more psychological journey rather than a direct narrative. By doing that, what it creates is an opportunity for the audience member to kind of fill in those blanks. Something that I noticed in watching the rehearsal was that you keep the entire company here while you're creating the piece as opposed to calling maybe just those three or four dancers that you have working. Why do you make that decision as a company? When I'm creating a new work like this one where I'm kind of fleshing out the narrative while I'm creating with them, it really helps me to kind of see who I have available. Sometimes I'll make a discovery mid-process in a movement that this particular character or this particular person has a role in it that I didn't foresee. They're my biggest inspiration. So keeping that energy going and keeping that sense of journey together is really important to me. I think in the end, it really is a process of discovery for all of us. The new full-length ballet, A Gothic Folktale, is the result of Wonderbound's latest discovery process. A Gothic Folktale really has been an evolving idea. And it is what we would call a Mongo collaboration. Mongo, because in addition to its 11 dancers, Wonderbound's Faye and Eamon enlisted the creative energy and talent of an illusionist and a musician to help craft its latest ballet. A sound that is at once old and new. That's what musician Jesse Manley strives for when creating music. I was really excited to um, do a full-length ballet and to be able to really dive in. I just knew I was going to evolve a lot as an artist. I immediately had a couple ideas in mind about music I thought would fit. When I knew the concept, and I knew there was gonna be magic involved. I was able to dive into a whole different kind of music. One of the things I did do for this project specifically was pick up the tenor banjo. It's a smaller version of the banjo, and it's got four strings, and it was used a lot in vaudevillian music and so with the feel and the concept of the project I felt like that just fit in really well. That vaudevillian style is infused in the work of illusionist Professor Felix. When Garrett and I first discussed the show he gave me such a fantastic question which was if there's anything you've always wanted to do on stage what is it so we can make it happen and uh, that is a fantastically exciting element of, of what we're doing. My greatest trick is turning adults into children, just taking people away from their, their daily lives and putting them somewhere else, even for just a moment. Costume designer Rachel Krass stitched together the magic, mood, and mysticism established by Gothic Folktale's other elements. In Gothic, we have uh, 
lots of different elements from lots of different eras. This jacket is for one of our dancers. He is supposed to be kind of like the producer of this vaudevillian magician show. It's made to be a little more imposing to show that authority and to be also very regal and elegant. Visually, you can kind of expect a lot of different textures. We're really big on volume and movement here, so there'll also be a lot of very velvety fabrics and lots of different surprises. Traditionally, dance companies present works once every few months. Wonderbound challenged itself to explore how it could not only reach audiences more frequently, but also engage with the community. With that goal in mind, Wonderbound, formerly Ballet Nouveau Colorado, relocated to an unconventional dance space in Denver. I think the fact that it used to be a car garage and now there's dancers in it, you see this amazing sense of awe as people walk by, expecting to just see a bunch of cars parked there, right? But instead, what they found is human beings that are working together to create something. And in the traditional reality that we were functioning in, we were only coming in contact with the community on a once every couple month basis. And we asked the question, what if we could be coming in contact with the community every single day? We're surrounded by three homeless missions and our audience on a daily basis is the homeless and they will stand outside our garage doors for hours and they'll clap and they'll bring their friends from the neighborhood and it gives them something that they desperately need. And I think it can promote hope moving downtown, moving into this garage space where we can open the doors and let people see the work that we're doing might create inspiration for them, add a little beauty to their lives where maybe they need a little beauty, but also engage in a deeper, a more subtle conversation about how we're all connected in a community. And that's what really what dance comes from. It comes from coming together. It is something that's meant to be shared. For more information, visit wonderbound.com. Up next, we stop by painter Jerry Misco's Las Vegas, Nevada studio. Misco's stylized renderings of neon road signs are growing in popularity both in and outside the city that first inspired them. But no matter where his celebrity takes him, Las Vegas will likely remain at the heart of what Misco does. My name is Jerry Misco and I'm a painter here in Las Vegas. I paint mostly abstracts based on neon and Vegas architecture. I'm originally from Las Vegas, Nevada, born and raised. It's home to me, you know, I love it here. I'm a desert rat, love Vegas. I'm a night owl, I love to be able to go do something, you know, paint till 4 a.m. and then go have a beer. You don't have to worry about everything being closed down, so I love the 24-hour nature of the place. I've exhibited all over town. I've done a lot of public art, the Centennial Mural over at Cashman Center, Cashman Field, Saks Fifth Avenue when they redid the Fashion Show Mall a few years back. Uh, I did two huge pieces for inside of there. There's murals all over downtown, the side of Emergency Arts, over on First Street. I've uh, probably shown with most of the galleries here in town, at least a group show here and there. And then I owned Dust Gallery for seven years and I showed there quite a bit. The Emergency Arts mural was pretty challenging. Just because it was where it was, 40 feet up in the air, with a 10 foot wide awning between the ground and it, so we had to rent a three point articulated crane to get up there in the beginning of May. And if you've been in Vegas long enough, you know May is windy. And <laughs> especially on a street like that where it's just open and coming down. So it was like painting on a pirate ship. <laughs> you know, you're up in this boom and the wind, sometimes the wind would blow and I would just do the brush and the wind would take me along the line and just kind of had to flow with that. I'm really attached to my, my Saks Fifth Avenue pieces. I did these big 10 foot by 10 foot paintings in there and the opportunity to do those really elevated me to a point where I could just keep doing this. And so they, they have a really special place in my heart. There's not a lot of artists in Vegas, or there weren't for a long time. Now it's kind of growing with the, the proliferation of the arts in downtown, that kind of thing. But I've been doing it for a long time, and you just, it's the Wild West. You get to do what you want to. So when I opened up a gallery and did it for seven years, there were no rules. We just went and did it, and that's great. The Renaissance Masters got me into what art could be. You know, this is beautiful and amazing. But then my heart really lied you know, with, with the pop artists and with comic book artists. I've been reading comics since I was a kid. And that strong graphic nature of the comic books has really informed you know, how I work. My process starts out just kind of wandering, wandering Las Vegas. 
until I either take a photograph as reference or find some reference. Usually a big, big, big piece, and I like to crop things down. So I'll find this little piece of that photograph, and I'll take that photograph and use that as inspiration, and then I build a digital sketch. That image will often just go and be a print. You know, straight from digital becomes one of my lithographs or one of my prints. And the ones I really like go off and become a painting. This is the stars from the Stardust, which is no longer with us. I'll go in and take this using it as my reference, and then I just really approach it kind of like a, a, a soul screen a lot, just one color at a time, one object at a time. I really love the machine made look of things, but I like making these by hand, so I really strive for my work to have a mechanical look to it, but when you get up and spend some time with it, you can see the artist's hand in there. Composition is all Vegas looking, but then there's a lot of color theory and you know, the lightest lights next to darkest darks, and what color is going to be next to this to make this pop out. I never use, like, people ask me all the time, oh, use neon paints. So, like, no, never use, like, those fluorescent paints. It's all just color theory. The Vegas lights are my inspiration. I mean, you see the work and you can see exactly where this stuff comes from. As a kid, even before I was old enough to be on the strip, gambling and playing, those neon signs, man, were, I loved them. We grew up on the west side, which drive down to Circus Circus. That driving down Sahara, and there was Foxy's Firehouse, this amazing fox putting out the neon fire. It's gone now, but it's beautiful. I just love driving past that. And the clown with his sucker, all those great lights, just as a kid, just blew my mind, and I've always loved that. Vegas at night is, is spectacular, there's nothing like it. A lot of great stuff going on in Vegas, and I will defend Vegas till my dying breath. <laughs> I'm a, sometimes maybe too much of a cheerleader, but it's, it's my home, it's my place. You know? and I like to say a lot that Monet had his water lilies and I have my neon signs. I want the piece to end up being just a beautiful object that makes you think about what it means to be a part of what's happening here in Las Vegas. People look to Vegas as this unique thing, this microcosm of what it is. And I, know, I can piggyback on that. You know, Vegas did all the work. And so I get to piggyback on what great things Vegas represents. And a lot of those things are going away. You know, it's, it's a different town than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago. We're not New York, you know? We're not New York City, we're not trying to be New York City. We're not LA. We're Vegas. We don't want to be anything else. It'll eat you up and spit you out. If, if you let it, you have to really be on your stuff, man. You can't just go out and, and get too into it and let it, let it devour you. Because with permission comes responsibility, <laughs> and there's nothing but permission here for the most part. I care about art and the arts in general, and I think that without art in our lives, it might sound trite, but it's a, it's a less bright, sadder place if you don't have these wonderful things that, that people make around you or people do. These things make everybody happier, you know, make life worth living. You have to get your, your voice heard. You don't want to be just this silent molecule. You know, there's billions of people. But everybody has a story, everybody wants to be heard, and everybody wants to express themselves on top of that, too. And art is something that makes the world a better place. It makes you proud to be human. It's something that you put in the world. And I think that's the most important thing about art is it's, you know, the participation in life. For more, visit jerrymisco.com. In this next segment, we sit down with the innovators behind techno music and learn just how instrumental the city of Detroit, Michigan was in the musical genre's early development. Techno is like a way of exchanging ideas and largely what techno is about is ideas. It's a largely instrumental music which was kind of unheard of at the time. Everything had lyrics in it, and everything in popular music or even underground music all, always had lyrics in it. And they just sometimes had vocals, sometimes it didn't. And as a producer, I found that so attractive because I could release the records anonymously. And like, no one knew who these artists were at such an early part of this. There was no real promotion or faces connected to it. And I could just just do something on my own and, and, and really escape into it and just pour as much energy as I could because I felt like, well, if I came up with something interesting enough that maybe this would lead to something. When I heard it, it found, sounded like the future to me. And like the lyrics would go through my head over and over again. 
it really just felt like it was cooler than Blade Runner. It like described like the future, like this gritty future to me, you know, and this search for, to find a new place to go with your mind now that you're kind of like experiencing the apocalypse, you know, it's like, you know, I feel like in a lot of ways, you know, Detroit is like, an ex like the city of the future. I started this, this sound, I, I kind of uh, coined the term techno music, and it, it started way back in the early 80s, and I think that uh, Detroit's claim to fame is that this music, uh, is, Detroit is the birthplace of, of, of what we call techno music, and I think Detroit is famous worldwide. The edge that the city of Detroit has adds a grit to the tone. So whether it's house music or techno or even hip hop that comes from Detroit, it still has like this this edge. Uh, you know, uh, it's more intangible, but it's like this rawness that is like you can just feel that it's real. has this ongoing reputation as being a, a place where new ideas are tried in this music. It's consistently pushing forward and looking and being progressive. We're kind of living in a time where uh, like a lot of ideas are recycled. So I think something new or even something just trying to be new or different really resonates with people. Detroit's place within it is it was actually the one of the first places to think of specific new ideas to make like these specific innovations and this particular sound palettes, particular ways of using drum machines. The dynamic of Detroit has a, has a, a, a subliminal, a subconscious effect over everybody that's here, but I think it does create a, a, a edge to the music that doesn't exist in any other city. It creates a toughness and a hardness that, you know, that is uh, beautiful in its own way. Before the festival started, you know, I used to always say, I, I, I traveled a lot to Europe and they would do, these, these type of festivals uh, started in Europe like years before we, we started doing it here. For years, we didn't have anything here that really was the focus of the, the party aspect of it. You know, there's plenty of labels and producers based here, but there was, there was no event that people felt like engaged enough to, to come to until the, the Movement Festival. I was under the belief that I would used to say this could never happen in the USA and then it happened and I was very amazed and, and, and surprised and, uh, and it's definitely a, a, a good achievement and a good feeling to see that you know that, that this festival is going on like the 11th or 12th year now. It's a chance for us to finally celebrate what we created here and what has made such a global impact. I mean, they're still excited to bring new Detroit techno artists to Croatia or Japan, you know, or Berlin, you know, et cetera, like all over the world. But when do they get to be celebrated at home? And when does the music get recognized here? Because it doesn't fit into, you know, a rock and roll format or selling something by a face or an image. You know, it's almost anti-image. It's a chance to actually celebrate what's been created here, have 100,000 people or however many it is that come down to Heart Plaza, and actually the community is not just known on the internet, which, you know, doesn't really have, like, you get excitement, but you don't have this biofeedback. You get this huge biofeedback of being in these crowds, feeling this emotion. It's like the myth of techno becomes reality for a marathon weekend of the festival and these after hour events. And it um, gives people internationally a place to come to. It's like the Hajj. It's their pilgrimage to the source of this music, you know, and the respect and the dreams that go into that are like palpable, like in that weekend. Great opportunity for 
local labels and DJs and artists to kind of showcase what they do. So it, it's been a, it's been a big, it's made a big difference, I would say. For more information, visit movement.us. In our last segment, we travel down to New Smyrna Beach, Florida to visit The Hub on Canal. That's where more than 80 local artists convene to cultivate their craft, to learn from one another, and to share their insight with curious visitors. See how the nature of this unique space allows for artistic exchange on a remarkable scale. There's something about when you walk in that door and somehow the curving floor and curving hallway leads them in and they get to see these cubicles full of art. It's just like nothing else. Once you walk in that door at the hub, it's like you're in another whole place. And there are over 80 artists in this building. It's a unique spot. You check your ego at the door and you come in and here's everything that you would imagine in art. And it's local art. We haven't brought it in from everywhere around the world. This is our local people, this is us. Painting for me is just, a, it's, a, it's, another, it's breathing. I have to do it, I love to do it. I also do assemblages and sculpture, so I do several other mediums, but basically I came here as a painter. I was a geologist for Texaco, and I decided that I wanted to retire early and that I wanted to do something with my life after I retired, and I didn't want to be a geologist. So I saw some birds at a, uh, at a gallery on Hilton Head, and I told my wife, that's what I'm gonna do. You learn to, instead of looking, you end up seeing. And then can you translate that to something? You basically end up being an impressionist. You're a philosopher. You're placing what you see and what you conceive to, like me, to a piece of wood. I think we all are learning from each other. Talking with a different artists and how they approach their art, which might be very different from me. It definitely has inspired me to go in different directions. I have gone from being a somewhat realistic artist to doing very traditional watercolors, and I definitely have been influenced by some of the abstract artists here and have gotten into doing abstract, which I absolutely love. And I teach a class where we work on all different surfaces. This is roofing paper. I'm gonna go in with a spreader. Most of my students are female and they range in age from 30 to probably 75. They tend to come in looking and then they ask about classes and they'll do the same with Bo. They bring a lot to, to the place as well because they're coming from different areas of life experiences and they see things a little bit differently than I do. People want to be part of a community. Not only do those people out on the street want to be part of us, we want to be part of them. I do enjoy teaching and seeing the, the changes in a, a student as they progress from real basic drawing into very elaborate paintings. I have my studio here and I like to come in because I like to be with the people. The people that come in, the people that are here, the visitors, the artists that are here. It really brings a lot of people and introduces them to art and they see actually artists working and it gives them and us a one-on-one -on -one with the public. The Hub is extremely important. It has brought all these artists together, and not just fine artists, but musicians, and poets, and writers, and just all the different very creative artists here, and then the visitors are equally as creative frequently. Together we're a force. Alone, we're just an artist. But together we're the Hub. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find feature videos, blogs, and information on upcoming art events. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.